Hi guys, welcome to COVID Commentary SLC. I'm glad you guys could join us for this Wednesday night show. As always, check us out on Facebook. You can find us by searching us up at COVID Commentary SLC on Facebook. I think we just broke like 250 followers now, so uh, we're starting to get a bit of a following there, starting to get a good amount of interaction from our audience, which is awesome. And tonight we are joined by one of CJ's old friends, KJ. Uh, he has a really complicated name, so maybe you'll hear him say it at some point in the show. So thanks for joining us tonight, KJ. Yeah, hey, th thanks for having me. Really, really cool to be on here. And like, congratulations on 200 followers. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's really cool to like be giving people good information during these times. So I think you guys are doing something pretty rad. Yeah, that's something I really want to focus on it, is being that source that's not biased and that's really just trying to get out the info that is just so hard to find in this world that we're in of misinformation. So on that topic, um, so we, we've been in this uh, coronavirus thing for quite a while now, but I was hearing about it for as far back as, you know, quite a few months ago. And I remember seeing it come across my timeline on Facebook and just, you know, not thinking anything of it at all. Uh, thinking of some fad coming across on Facebook. What, what was your first reaction when you first heard of the coronavirus? Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. My first reaction, I heard about it in Wuhan. And uh, I had just watched the One Baby Nation documentary on Amazon Prime, which is just terrific. And it was kind of talking about that one baby policy. And I, I was just joking, like, haha, seems like something they would do if they were willing to, you know, put down babies for population control. And I, I really did not think anything much of it, even when they were shutting down. But then as soon as it went to uh, about like two other countries and it started hitting Europe, I'm like, okay, this might be something that's uh, that's serious, especially seeing the reactions of the country. Yeah, that's kind of that was kind of my reaction too. I mean, they, they they you know it seemed like it was downplayed a lot, but once they started shutting things down, and I had recently started learning a little bit about China and how much they just are so heavily focused on economic prosperity that it's just really really odd that they would just shut things down you know it's just really not something that they would do so when they did that uh that's i didn't personally notice that myself but the, the people that i listened to uh they pointed that out and was saying that it's going to be this huge thing and i i actually stopped listening to a few of their podcasts about the coronavirus because i was interested in the economic problems that we were having as a nation uh, I guess I'm a bit of a doomer. I kind of went from uh, all the problems that I was having with global warming, and then that kind of led me into all the more immediate problems that we're having with the economy. And, you know, so I was kind of just wanting to get more and more info about that. And then Chris Martinson kept bringing up the, the coronavirus. And, you know, I skipped a couple of his shows. I was just not that interested. And then it turned into this huge thing where, and he was making predictions that all of the United States was going to be shut down. All of the world was going to be having problems and that this was the thing that was going to bring about the economic collapse that I had been hearing so many people kind of hint towards. So now that we're to the point where we're at right now, how serious of a, of a impact do you think it's having on our health and our economy? Uh, you know, well, the health impact is a little bit more questionable because, uh, you know, a lot of these numbers seem scary, but if you look at them at, at a per capita basis, they're not quite as scary as they indicate. But then there's little things about the virus, like the way it spreads and how little we understand about it and how all this new information comes up. Like, sure, there's there's definitely health concerns, but a lot of these economic concerns are imminent. I mean, you're seeing like 50% rates of people not being able to pay their rent. Um, you were already having people barely making it paycheck to paycheck and all of a sudden they're out of jobs. Like, And now you're seeing like an inverse problem where in some of these states that are reopening, uh, they were giving extra unemployment. It was like an extra $600 a week um, because of coronavirus relief for the next four months. So now you're seeing a lot of states where people could go back to work, but now they're not going to because it's all of a sudden more profitable to just collect unemployment by a few hundred dollars a month. And... Uh, I mean, these these economic problems are imminent. I mean, we're going to have to print a lot more money if we're not going to reopen the economy soon, if that's something we're interested in preserving, if we're interested in preserving these failing markets. And unfortunately, I think that is basically what we are interested in, is preserving the failing market. Oh, it looks like we lost CJ. Hopefully he joins back in. But yeah, it looks like that is what 
we are interested in and have been interested in for the past 20 years or so. Um, you know, the crash we had in 2008, that, that's, I believe, when the, the, co the term was coined too big to fail. And, it, you know, there's some truth to that. We, we couldn't just let these big businesses and corporations and banks and hedge funds just fail because of how woven they are into our society of just how, how big of problems that would create if we did let them fail. Um, I've heard some arguments that we should have probably let them fail and gone through the pain uh, back in 2008, but yet that's when we kind of mastered our money printing and came out with all of these different strategies to make to make money printing, first of all, complicated so nobody understands it because you can't have the average American understanding that we are printing all this money, which they work so hard for, you know, it would just ruin this illusion that this piece of paper called the dollar is actually worth something. Um, and, and so they, they, first of all, made it very complicated and then they made, they had it to where they were able to inject it in just the right parts of the economy to where we wouldn't see inflation happen so much in the, in the way that would really be obvious to Americans because if Americans see a ton of inflation then they're going to freak out and they're going to try and get out of the dollar. So that would create a, a cascading effect that would make the dollar worth less and less. So they have to avoid that. You know, I believe the CPI has been around 2% or so for quite some time. And uh, I've also heard that's not true. And, you know, I've heard a lot of manipulation around the CPI, which basically measures inflation and also the GDP and the unemployment. There's just a lot of manipulation with the numbers to make it seem like the economy is really good, which is kind of funny because Trump was actually talking a lot of crap on Obama because he was using the manipulated numbers to make the economy look good. And now Trump himself is also relying on the manipulated numbers to make him look good. So on to the next question here, how, so you're in California. I'm actually not sure if we said that already, but you're in California. We're here in Utah. We're talking over the internet here. Um, so how has, I know a lot of crazy things. That's actually where I've heard a lot of uh, th a lot of news coming out of is from California. I know at one point me and CJ covered uh, a piece where they were like driving tanks through San Francisco, I think. So how has the virus actually changed your, your specific living situation, if at all? Uh, well, real quick on that last thing you were saying, um, just a little fun fact. After 2008, that's when they decided to change the way they measured a lot of those uh, economic statistics like CPI and GDP and unemployment. Yeah. Uh, those, those things went hand in hand, you know, because it like it gave them the permission to uh, inflate and skew the numbers at their will moving forward. So they could always make it seem like, don't worry, everything's fine. We fixed the problem. Uh, but anyways, onto the California thing. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that in there because it's kind of, I think it's a fun fact. Yeah, it's a, it, um, I believe it's called so, like hedonic adjustments that they made to uh, to the CPI at least, but go on. Um, yeah, so in California, uh, you know, at first, I go to university at California State Long Beach. And, uh, you know, at first there was a little talks about things happening in California. It's about mid-March and, uh, you know, there was that one ship that uh that docked in california the cruise ship you know yeah, trump the, let him dock that, in the bay that diamond princess i believe yeah 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 that's the one thank you and um uh from there things started moving very rapidly i mean within a few days the bay had a lockdown within the next day all the ucs had canceled classes within two days all the cal states had uh, canceled classes and moved to virtual and by the end of the week all of the elementary schools and public schools were virtual and the immediate thing that followed was a mass hysteria of panic buying. I mean, I'd never, I'd never seen Costco like that. Uh, and I, you know, I, I live in like Orange County, so it's a, it's a fairly nice part of California. But uh, I'm, I'm reading news articles all the time about people all over the state, even in places like Huntington Beach, having fistfights and brawls in the parking lot because you know that person got six cases of toilet paper and I didn't get any. And you know, it's, it, it, it was really freaky there for a second you know, going to the stores and seeing the stores like that and seeing people behaving that way. And it was really before people were uh, wearing the masks and the gloves. Uh, and now, you know. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask if people were 
taking it seriously like if uh when you started going out and what the general uh the general feel of i guess when it initially hit you know was it you know everybody started wearing masks and gloves and like trying to be super sanitary but or was it just like this like okay we better just stock up on shit before you know uh yeah yeah so uh when, when it first happened no one was wearing masks and gloves and i'd never seen the grocery stores that crowded and it was kind of a point of concern it's like well this is something that you know is like airborne and passes you know human to human through close quarters and all of a sudden we're all flocking to the supermarkets in mass and just like putting ourselves in these contexts where we're just swarmed by people it's like this is how it's going to spread um but then you know our governor has been very involved to to put it lightly so the people didn't put it on themselves to wear masks, but all of a sudden the governor started getting more strict about it. And, you know, now in some cities you get tickets. Uh, you don't get tickets anywhere in Orange County, but most businesses won't let you inside without a mask. Uh, so what, what, what you were talking about in, in the stores there, that's, that's, I had that exact same thought that, what, you know, when, when the, it seemed like there was like one day here in Utah where everything just changed. Like, the sentiment that I was seeing from people was it's all fake. The government's, you know, trying to just get your attention, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it was like, boom, it changed. Everyone was kind of taking it seriously. And then that was the day that everyone rushed to the stores and got a bunch of food. And I believe I saw a, a news article, you know, suggesting that people get uh, like a month's worth of food. So they were almost being told to go and, and panic buy. So as far as what what you're hearing from the the your governor specifically, do you feel like he's overstepping, or do you feel like the rules and regulations are 100 percent necessary, or do you feel like it's kind of a mix between the two? You know that 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 really depends on something that like I, I'm honestly like not really qualified to say with a lot of certainty, but that depends on how dangerous this virus really is. You know, if this virus really is something that's very dangerous and something we should be tremendously concerned about, I think he's doing the right thing. Um, but if the virus is being like very blown out of proportion, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I was going to say with just California, uh, the general uh, idea, the general feel of the public is usually like, you know, be chill, like, you know, not uh, to take things too seriously because like, you know, people usually get stuck in two hours of traffic, like going to LA and stuff like that. So you kind of just <laughs> go with the flow and it's like a chill, uh, uh, way of life out there. But, um, has, have you noticed that it's been a lot more, uh, just like seriousness or a lot more people going out or, uh, you know, it's, it's a really strange mix. Like it's very nice. The roads are just empty. You know, the other day I just drove up to Morrow Bay, which is normally like a six hour drive. I got there in three hours and there was nobody there. Nobody on nice. the roads. It was, it was, I mean, honestly, amazing. You know, I was social distancing the whole time because everyone was home. Um, but then, you know, you're in the suburbs and there's just, just hundreds of people going on walks, riding bikes. You know, the governor did say that people were allowed to go outside. And uh, th this is like, it's really my concern. And like I said, I'm not like a pandemic expert or a disease expert. So I, I, I don't know enough to say anything without like, with any th authority. But at the end of the day, if the virus is something that we need to be concerned about, I would say as a nation, we're not doing enough. If you're looking at the countries that are starting to reopen, that have actually taken care of things, and they've actually seen their new cases go down starkly, they had really strict shutdowns. You know, they weren't letting people go on walks or parks, and they, you know, they just put their heads down and they said, okay, everyone stay home for three weeks, four weeks, and then it's over. But we have this like weird one foot in, one foot out. And it's like, we're kind of shut down, but we're kind of not. And I don't know. It's like, we should commit to something. We should either shut down and do it hard for a few more weeks and ride it out or just reopen. But it's like, at a certain point, if we reopen too soon, you, you have one or two options that happens with that. Either the virus is worse than we thought and it spreads tremendously across the country. Or we blew it out of proportion and we made everybody suffer an inconvenience for really no reason at all. So I, I, I just see it as like a lose-lose to open too soon. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of mystery around this virus. I, I mean, it's it's one of those things that you kind of just have to react based on 
uh, you know, not complete science, just on, on just quick things that you're seeing and, and almost just follow the precautionary principle, which is basically assume that it's more dangerous than we know, just because we don't know, you know? Um, and it's kind of uh, interesting that we're, we're not going to really, I, like I see a lot of people just straight talking shit on the, the closing and the lockdowns because, you know, we've had 75,000 confirmed deaths in the U.S. And depending on what lens you, you look at that through, that may look like a very small amount of deaths, you know, compared to some things. And, you know, but that, that those deaths have, have been low during this lockdown and we're still losing 2,500 people per day. So it's kind of interesting that we're in a sense, if we were successful and the lockdowns were to really put a, a lid on this thing, we may not really know. And, and the people that are really just denying this whole thing and talking shit on it, they would kind of come out on top saying, Oh, we should have never done anything. But yet it's actually because of the lockdowns that we would be successful. And, and I, I really liked what you said about uh, how we have one foot in and one foot out. And this is just such a complicated problem because unless you fully stamp this fire out, it's just going to reignite. So, you know, it, it, even in places like China where they had really strict lockdowns, things that we would just call brutal and just, uh, you know, against our rights here, you know, they did that there. And yet now they're have showing a lot of evidence of a second outbreak. It's really hard to determine, especially just us guys talking on this podcast. None of us are experts. It's really hard to determine what we should really do, especially when you throw the economy into the mix. Well, and one of the things you end up losing if you start to reopen places, I mean, yeah, it's like you, you want to reopen and keep the economy afloat. But then, I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, but like you almost need to still have that fear factor because once you start opening places, if, you know, if and when we see that, you know, second outbreak happen, it's going to result in all these people being like, no, we're not going to stay home. We didn't get sick before. Like we don't need to wear masks. And, you know, that losing that fear factor is just going to like influence things to go way south if we do have another outbreak. Yeah, and it's a it's like a really really complex problem at this point because uh you know as of right now if you look at like our mortality rate it's better than a lot of places on Earth, um, but also if we reopen too soon and we have like a massive outbreak that just runs its course because we are not shut down like using like let's say the Spanish flu for instance you know like a city like Philadelphia didn't shut down and they had this big I think it was Veterans Day parade. And a ton of people got sick and died there. But in the rest of the country, they had more stricter lockdowns. They didn't celebrate and it didn't happen. But my point being is uh, we forced the thing reopen too soon. And maybe our mortality rate jumps because all of a sudden the hospitals are beyond capacity. And you have people who just can't get access to ventilators because the hospitals are overworked. And uh, that's something that I found really interesting about Como over in New York, where he was saying, like, let's start reopening when hospitals are below 30% capacity. And I was like, hey, I like that way more than two more weeks. That's a real number. That's something I can gauge and I can tell. And I think that's like a good thing to base it on because we like we really do need to like appreciate the position that these healthcare workers are in and appreciate that like, I don't know about you, but like I would I would hate for like me or someone I love to get sick and they can't even get into a hospital and get a ventilator because they're just beyond capacity because we kicked this thing open too soon. Yeah, that's definitely, I think the number one most important thing about this virus is not overwhelming the hospital system. And that's something we've talked about on this show quite a bit is that is just a horrific thing to think about if, uh, because we have this great medical system here in the US and in many other places across the world do too. Uh, but it's not meant to handle thousands and thousands of people coming in every day. And if you had to totally reject people from coming in, yeah, we would see the, the mortality rate go up quite a bit. And I do want to go ahead and jump over to the numbers right now. Um, you spoke about the, the US mortality rate uh, so, so I was I was thinking about this today. So we have 1.2 million confirmed cases in the U.S., and we are currently at 75,000 deaths. So really, 
that's about that's over five percent, and that's not even measuring it the the more proper way, which would be to to compare the deaths, uh, you know, versus the total recovered. So out of all the closed cases, you know, because obviously there we still have nine hundred thousand active cases that haven't gone into death or recovery. So out of out of all of our closed cases, which we we've, we've had two hundred eighty thousand. 287,000 cases which have come to an end here in the U.S. Uh, 74% of those have recovered and 26% of them have died. And obviously there's many, many different ways to look at that. You know, there, there's probably tons of cases we're missing and, and all, all sorts of different things that you could add into that equation. But, you know, no matter what way we look at this, the, the death toll in basically every country is pretty significant at this point. And a couple other things I wanted to point out, uh, we're seeing in Brazil a huge jump in cases. I'm not 100% sure what they were thinking. I'm pretty sure they were they were one of the countries that uh, kind of didn't want to take this too seriously, uh, like, like Mexico and like the UK that kind of just thought they would just uh, ignore all the hysteria. And they got... 11,800 cases just today in Brazil, nearly 700 deaths. And, you know, they don't have quite as many people as we do, but they, they're still a pretty big population. So that's not too alarming. But also in Russia, 10,000 more cases today. So, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're, I, we have 95,000 cases globally in the world. And so that is, I believe that's one of, oh, cause we have had a hundred thousand case day. I think we've had a couple. So 95,000. Yeah. So we're seeing quite a bit and in the U S 2,500 deaths just today, that is, that is really shocking. So I, I brought this up a couple of times on past shows, the leading cause of death in America is heart disease and they average about 1,750 deaths per day. So anything over 1,750 deaths per day is the leading daily cause of death. So right now, and this has been true for over three weeks now, uh, almost every day, the coronavirus is the leading cause of death in the U.S. You know, I, re I really like that connection you made there because a lot of people who are trying to deny this use that argument like, oh, we don't, we don't police people on their food and there's heart disease. And it's like, well, yeah, but like this is... You know, you can't, you can choose your diet. You can't choose to just not get a, a virus. Um, but but I, I think that's a really good parallel. And it's something that's really interesting about statistics and why Einstein's theory of relativity is probably my favorite theory. Because, you know, we could present one, one set of numbers, right? And you and I could both come to wildly different conclusions based on that one set of numbers. And we could both write articles to sway public opinion that are perfectly valid based on those same numbers, just based on like how we choose to look at them. You know, are we going to look at that like, oh, you know, how many people are dying a day or just like overall, you know, it's like oh, it's barely anybody. Don't even worry. Your grandparents are ready to die for the economy. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting thing you pointed out. I think that that kind of uh, data manipulation is something we've really seen as a main theme over this whole coronavirus. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's why, like I said at the beginning, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here because there's just this huge discrepancy and inconsistency. inconsistency. You know, you're, you're having different states reporting different things. You're having different countries reporting different things. You're, you're hearing a ton about the inconsistencies in which something is considered a COVID-19 death or not, which I'm sure you've read articles about that. If, um, but then, you know, you have the state saying one thing, the media saying one thing. And then the White House saying one thing, and it's all kind of conflicting. Like it, it's not really aligning in a neat way, and it, it's putting us in a weird position where you know we we need to know what's going on. We have lives that we need to tend to, and this is a pandemic and emergency, and it's important to stay informed about it. But if everything's conflicting, where's the truth in all of it? You know what what, what do you do? And uh, it's 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 frustrating. Pretty, yeah, it's it, it's it's really frustrating. Yeah, you just get <laughs> yeah, you get stuck with fifty different outlooks from like you know every different you know news different news out there and different uh, like you know different uh, newspapers and online and you have so many uh, 
you know, fake websites out there and just people that are trying to throw to get together information so that way they get views and people just read their stuff and follow their page. But I mean, when it comes down to it, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that have not been, uh, not been focused on like whatsoever. Like you have countries like India, like India is the second most populous country in the world. And it's like, you know, what a quarter of the size of the United States. And you're going to tell me that their cases are like, you know, they only have 52,000 cases. And, you know, over half of their entire country, like, over half their population lives in slums. So, like, it's just, like, there's, it's just, like, globally, I feel like the outbreak is a lot more um, uh, spread out than people want to uh, admit it. And I feel like just even the lack of testing in those kind of countries and, like, even just, you know, countries in Africa and whatnot, you know, you're just kind of stuck with this idea of you know the numbers that they're putting out there and i mean there's some of these countries that are a little more believable like i mean i guess the u.s is just believable in my sense just because we wouldn't be posting numbers that high if we were trying to like manipulate things to be a little bit lower you know so <clears throat> i mean that's just one of the main things and then like like i said just with having 50 different news outlets you're essentially setting yourself up to like nobody nobody knows the truth like it it's sad to say that like i wish the government would put something out that would be like a basic news stream that would be the truth but it would probably be a lie and then people would probably twist that so like there's there's absolutely no way to get a uh, current exact uh you know accurate idea of everything that's going on or how serious things are unless you take the time to really you know dig through everything yeah take, take the time to just swim through the mud of bullshit i mean it's just it's a joke right now and i can't tell you how many times i've come face to face with misinformation and then i do a quick calculation in my brain like am i going to be able to change this person's mind and i'm am i going to be able to make any difference here or are they just going to think what i'm saying is propaganda and countless times throughout this this coronavirus, I've just walked away and just been like, well, there's another casualty. I, I'm not got, there's no hope in being able to handle this misinformation problem. And I think I think misinformation is winning this battle, which is just really shocking thing to see. I don't as much as I want some people to kind of hear uh, the, the more true thing, I don't think anything I'm going to be able to say is going to be able to reach into the masses and be able to give them a more true perspective. I mean, even the fact that our show is named COVID commentary means that YouTube is not showing this to anyone, period. So the only people listening to our show are people that we are sending the links to directly because YouTube does not want to spread more and more info about coronavirus or COVID or pandemic or any of those trigger words, you know, they have, they have bots that basically go through and, and read all the words that we're saying right now. They process them out into a script. And if we say anything they don't like, uh, well, you know, we don't even have ads on our, our show because it's so small, but I've heard countless channels getting demonetized and, and, or getting uh, put into a more restricted category to where you have to be signed into a YouTube account that is confirmed to be over 18 just to be able to see the views, which actually has a really drastic impact. So there's just all this misinformation and censoring. And for our previous listeners, I just want to say that is a key feature for the fourth, fourth turning. I don't want to go into the fourth turning too much, but for those who have been following the show, this type of misinformation and mistrust of social systems is a key thing that happens in every fourth turning and really the only way for us to break this system is to go through a crisis because a crisis brings us together and it, it makes us reevaluate our values and realize what is important so i think this is a good segue leading into what i really wanted to talk about on this show which is the this uh video i've seen going around recently called the plandemic because it talks a lot about how this this whole virus was planned, which you know I there, we've said multiple times on this show that we think that this could be planned. 
Um, there's a lot of things that I disagree with this pandemic video. Uh, they started off by talking a lot about uh, Dr. Fauci and his sketchiness, and he really is. He really does have a lot of sketchiness to him. I actually have an article here uh, about Dr. Fauci and his connections to to the corona to the, the the lab in Wuhan. So let me just go ahead and read off a little bit of this. Dr. Anthony Fauci is an advisor to President Donald Trump and something of an American folk hero for his steady calm leadership during the pandemic crisis. At least one poll shows that Americans trust Fauci more than Trump on the coronavirus pandemic. And I got to admit, when, when I first kind of saw him, he really has that like friendly, logical sort of vibe that you can just trust. And, uh, you know, he was even played by Brad Pitt, which really uh, I thought was kind of entertaining when I saw it. But now that I know how sketchy his past is, that makes me think like, was that just trying to get America to fall in love with this guy by having Brad Pitt play him? And the article continues, but just last year, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the organization led by Dr. Fauci, funded scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and other institutions for work on gain of function research on bat coronaviruses. So I wanna throw in a quick plug here for uh, Chris Martinson from Peak Prosperity. I know we're talking a lot about here about misinformation. If you want to find a true, just a nugget of gold, a diamond in the rough is Chris Martinson from Peak Prosperity. You will not regret it. I am so grateful that I ran into him before this started. So I was able to build kind of a relationship with his videos and to the point where I trusted him. Now he has just been my go-to source. And so I want to say that he himself has actually brought up this connection with Fauci. So this is not just some conspiracy theory bullshit uh, of, you know, just people trying to defame him. This is a real thing. And th th this gain of function research, what that basically means is they are testing and, and experimenting with coronaviruses to make them more potent. So gain of function. That means they're making the function more functionable, basically. Uh, let me continue on with this article a little bit, and then I'll, I'll jump over. To wait, wait, one, one, one question real quick. Uh, do you know if that, that lab is run by or run by the WHO, or is that like a state-sponsored lab? Just curious I, if, if that's I, I, I don't know too much about it. I wouldn't guess that it is ran by the WHO. I, I, I know it's it's sponsored it may by more than just Dr. Fauci. There's many sponsors that have been involved with this. Many countries. I heard Australia was involved. Um, I don't know too much about the WHO except for that they are actually fairly corrupt and, and they're basically uh, trying to make China look good in this. So I'm not 100% sure of this. I would assume that they are not necessarily in charge of it though. But uh, in the article here it says, in 2019... With the backing of NIAID, the National Institute of Health committed $3.7 million over six years for research that included some gain-of-function work, which that is just totally experimental sci-fi, you know, introducing new DNA strands in with other ones to, to mix them together, just really uh, cutting-edge stuff. The program followed another 3.7 million five-year project for collecting and studying bat coronaviruses, which ended in 2019, bringing the total to 7.4 million. So that part of this pandemic video, uh, I do agree with. And that's what they started out with was basically saying how sketchy Dr. Fauci is. And that I that's something I've heard from multiple sources. So I agree with that. Do, do you guys have anything you want to add to that? portion of this uh, uh yeah sure i mean i think it's like in inherently a flaw right now is uh i think if you look at anyone who's been involved in american politics for like over 20 years there's going to be enough of a track record to be like oh this person's sketchy and that's part of why hillary clinton wasn't able to beat donald trump because it's like she's a career politician and it was pretty easy to be like yeah but question mark uh so so i don't know like like there's definitely sketchiness all over our politics right now. And I, I think that's 
part of the problem with the misinformation is that like if you look at anybody too seriously, it's like, oh, they're kind of sketchy. Then you you take that in aggregate and you look at everybody who's involved and all these sketchy individuals who've all been there their whole career. And it's like, oh, if they're all sketchy, can we trust them? Well, it's like if you have somebody like uh, if you have somebody like Trump uh, just, you know, basically addressing the nation on you know, a daily basis, if not a bi late daily basis at some points, um, you know, you have all these Americans that don't support him and they don't necessarily want to listen to him. But when you do put a face like Fauci out there, then it makes like, you know, I've, I've heard people say they wait for him to talk and that's the only reason they'll listen to a Trump speech just because the, he, he, is a different voice and i mean i think you're right in that sense like you know the whole brad pitt thing like if you get him to be a likable person then people will you know heed by whatever he does say or you know people are more likely to heed by whatever he says and you know that directs how uh, directly impacts how the american people react to things yeah, I think uh, personally, my my personal opinion is we can't draw too many conclusions from this whole Dr. Fauci Wuhan lab connection. I don't see anything particularly sinister that really stands out. I mean, like I said, a, bu a bunch of different people and sources were funding this lab, and you know, th there's nothing for sure saying that there is a sinister thing involved in this, but. There is a connection, so there there is that. Um, the next claim that the video made, the pandemic video, was that the virus has shown evidence that it's been min manipulated by man, and uh, you know, kind of the the main narrative that we hear is that the virus came from a bat, it came from a wet market in China because they eat all sorts of different animals and stuff, and I believe we have had viruses come out of that very. Uh, that very activity in our past. So it is somewhat believable. But uh, from what I've heard, that that lab didn't actually sell bats at all. So it seems very unlikely that it would have come from there. And also, I believe China completely destroyed that wet market as to kind of cover up the evidence. Uh, so it really, I haven't seen any definitive evidence that it actually came from a bat. And, you know, I'm going to just refer right over to Chris Martinson again because he is the one who is uh, really digging deep with this. And he has a scientific background and he understands all the terminology. Uh, his past couple videos have been specifically about this topic. Has the virus been edited? Uh, is there any evidence to show that or is it just a simple mutation? And the, what I was able to understand from his very complicated videos, which I'm glad they're complicated because that shows that he knows more than I do. I would suggest listening to people that you don't fully understand because that means you're being introduced to new topics that you can kind of start to get a grasp on slowly. That's how I learned about finance anyway. But the, what I really took away from his video is that what this virus shows is that it was not just a... a traditional mutation that this virus went through from i believe sars cov1 to sars cov2 which uh the the mutation it went through normally what will happen in a mutation is as the as the virus is replicating uh one of the letters will change i, I if some of you have taken any classes revolved around that you've probably seen the the long lines of letters separated by lines that represent dna and it's just like four different letters that it can be, but this whole complex chain of letters is what represents that life form. And sometimes those letters will just change. They'll just go from an A to a B or an A to a C or whatever the letters are. And But what happened with this virus is not a mutation. It's called an insert. And that's because there wasn't just a letter or two that changed. The... the, the combination of letters was going 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 and then there was a breaking point and there was a new a, a new set of letters added in and then it continued so if you look at the virus which it supposedly came from uh there it's not just letters change there's an entirely new section of letters in there it seems pretty short i believe it's only like five letters long 
but you know that would be part of that gain of function it, it, i mean there's no direct evidence tying it to that there's actually a lot of scientists that completely deny this and if you if you watch joe rogan he had a scientist on that said there's no evidence whatsoever that this was manipulated by man which when i first watched that i was a little confused i was like why is he so conclusively jumping to that and and you know dr martinson actually kind of talked shit on on the guy that was on joe rogan so you know really made me question whether that guy was on there because he know joe he's no joe's Ro joe rogan is very popular and maybe he got on there to try and spread this message that it wasn't manipulated. So it really does seem like there is some manipulation happening to this and also some level of cover-up. There's many other reasons that Chris Martinson talked about why he thinks this is manipulated. I would suggest checking out some of his videos at Peak Prosperity. If you YouTube Peak Prosperity, all of his stuff's on there. He does a daily show. I would highly suggest anyone to go and check that out but have you guys heard anything about that specific topic i mean just the little bits and pieces here i mean i i've heard a, another just like outlet was that even if it wasn't like necessarily you know bats that were getting it but that they were testing um you know the original strand of sars on you know animals and essentially let those animals loose and kind of uh, as nature took its course like it would virus is, uh, you know it mutated naturally on its own from that sense and then mutated into this um, you know virus that can be carried by humans and then can be spread by humans but I mean in that sense it's almost you know you have to look at it like a, a flu sense because you know, we have a new strain of, of flu, quote unquote, every, you know, couple years. And they're like continuously trying to, uh, you know, test on these new um, serums and vaccines and whatnot and try to get the right ones that are going to, you know, boost your immune system enough to, you know, fight off whatever strain is out there. And I think that's one of the things that people are overlooking as well, you know, when it comes down to a... Uh, second outbreak and uh, you know i think it's going to be much worse because at that point you know it's going to have an entire year to have gone through um, you know just humans and we've seen that it can be dormant and we've seen that it uh, you know people show uh, no signs of infection when they are carriers and you know they're able to spread it and you know that's going to be our long-term downfall is that we underestimate the idea of this thing you know, being it, at one point it was so simple and it was mutated and now we're trying to work with something brand new that, you know, we haven't necessarily seen like all the way. I mean, I'm sure that there was some sort of testing beforehand in labs and whatnot, but the way that it's spread on the American people and just globally, um, you know, it's going to, in return, it's going to really result in a lot of new, uh, new vaccines and a new a lot of new manipulations and mutations that people are trying to jump ahead like at this point we got caught with our pants down now you know 10 years from now 20 years from now you know they're going to start studying and trying to figure out a cure for whatever's next at this point and i don't know i feel like the whole thing is pretty dangerous like just let nature takes its, take its damn course and uh same thing with like you know labs manipulating viruses like you know especially if they're going to release any animals into the wild or if they're going to sell those animals or whatever that they've been testing on like there's it's just irresponsible <laughs> there's just no reason for it and it's going to result in definitely some other sort of outbreak in our near future in our near, ugh, near future if we don't uh do something about it yeah and uh, i think on the topic of uh you know going back to like the the pandemic or scandemic or whatever the uh, the conspiracy theorists are calling it right now um if you look at a lot of the sources they're spreading like oh you know the the closure is killing more people than the coronavirus is and you know the shutdown economy and it was made in a lab and you look at all of these sources and you really take them under scrutiny and you don't you know you read beyond the article and actually click at the bottom and look at what the source is uh, most of the sources are going to be really fringe. You know, you're going to look at like the community, like the uh, 
the disaster like pandemic community that that like the WHO and CDC and all of the affiliate universities and institutions that work with them, and they're kind of all going to be saying the opposite. And you have like these few fringe kind of, you know, maybe biased, maybe just slightly lacking credibility, you know, not quite as prestigious, whatever it may be. But then they, they post these contrary findings uh, and they're really just the outlier of what the whole community thinks. And then like people just tend to run with those just like, oh, well, I found this one article that validates my suspicion. So this is the one I'm going to base my whole argument on even though 90% of the scientific and disease community is going to be saying this other thing. And I think it's like a big issue with what you guys were talking about earlier with the misinformation, you know, like all of these uh, news outlets, they're not really concerned with giving us the truth and being moral upright citizens. You know, at the end of the day, what they're doing is a business. And just like CJ said, you know, their, their primary operation is they need clicks, they need views, they need you to go there. And if sometimes they need to, publish some questionable or fringe studies to make it really clickbaity and play on public perception. I think they're not afraid to do that. And it, it just creates this whole culture where, pe where people can like orchestrate all of these like really fringe studies that shouldn't be taken seriously and use them to build like these complex counter arguments for doing what's in the best favor of society. Yeah, I completely agree. And with, with the society that we're in right now, um, the media and the government and all sort of authority figures, even police officers have been coming into question uh, in the past decade or so. Uh, it's just gotten to the point where nobody really trusts them. So I would say it's more mainstream now to not trust the mainstream than it is to trust the mainstream. So it's this almost like paradox, this mainstream paradox happening right now where actually more people are, are willing to believe in some sort of conspiracy theory, even if it's just a, a small bit of conspiracy theory, because of how much bullshit we get fed on the daily from the mainstream and then, you know, something like this comes along where it's like, uh, hold up, guys, we actually need you to believe us this time. There's actually a real threat this time. We're not just crying wolf. I know we cried wolf the past 20 times, but now it, we got a real threat coming. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, that's the issue with the, even in the whole video, how they, like, say that, uh, you know, not wearing masks uh or is better for your immune system and you have a better chance of surviving things and if you wear masks then you're essentially cutting your body off from all this essential bacteria and viruses that are in the air that actually uh, in return make your immune system stronger but it's like no you're still walking around your house like that's full of bacteria you're still in your yard you're still going outside like walking around wearing a mask in a area where you're going to be around you know 50 other people is responsible not stupid yeah it's not like he's talking about like you put yourself into a giant plastic bubble before you leave the house and make sure that you're breathing only oxygen from your oxygen tank it's like no just wear a mask so you're not getting like direct like people's coughs and sneezes into your breath like mouth like you're still getting access to bacteria and people it's not like you're completely sterile as a human yeah i could see if you spent like you know an entire three months uh like in a hospital or something or like you know if you spent an entire year in a place that like is like completely sanitary then like yeah that's gonna have an effect on your immune system but wearing a mask in a store or you know walking around somewhere where there's a lot of people is you know that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna save you from getting a potentially harmless harmful virus that people can spread in big groups and whatnot instead of uh you know just wearing a mask and taking it off and you know you don't need to wear it all the damn time i've seen people wearing them in their cars and i just laugh because i'm like you're the only one that's been in your car well you know it's like like wondering who to believe is like we were talking about like before we uh, we started the show uh just you have like donald trump has really validated his claim of the mainstream media and they've done it to themselves you know, he says something and they really skew what he says and take it out of context. Like that disinfectant thing, I think is a perfect example. Like the media made it sound like he was talking about drinking bleach, which is not what he said. He went on a little bit of a ramble, sure. But he didn't just say drink disinfectant and inject disinfectant. And uh, when the media does that, they prove him right by being fake news because they're making fake news up 
to get the attraction. You know, they're they're basically like spinning the articles that they know, whatever their audience is, they know it's the the spin that their audience wants to see. And now you have Donald Trump, who's been caught lying plenty, but he's also proven that the media lies about him plenty too. So now you have this weird relationship where it's like, well, hmm, the media proves that the White House is lying to me, and the White House has proven that the media is lying to me, and I have this real need for information because I'm in this, you know, very unprecedented pandemic time and I'm worried about my life and my well-being and my family and I need information from somewhere, but I can't quite trust the people that I'm supposed to be getting information from. And it puts people in a very, very strange position. And I, I just think this is like, it, it almost begs for the idea of having state-run media. But then again, if the White House is already lying, what, what, what good would state-run media do? It's just like, how, like, how do we resolve this, I guess, is my point. And I think I think podcasts are a great start, you know, just like like taking power back into our own hands, I think is just a great start and something we should engage in more. I support small business for that that fact, if it matter to you. Yeah. And I think from from what I've seen, uh, when people kind of get backed into that corner that you're talking about where they're like, man, this is a real problem, but and I need real information, but I just don't know where to go. What what I kind of see is pe people's personal bias tend to take the reins there and kind of lead them down whatever path they want to be true. Like, for instance, I was just talking with my wife before the show, and she was telling me about someone she was talking to who, who runs a business. And, you know, he obviously is busy all day and isn't just heavily researching things like me. And... Uh, you know, most people don't have five, six hours a day that they can put into research. And so they kind of just like, you know, he, he wants his business to open and he doesn't know anyone that's died. So, you know, he's kind of falling into this group of people that's like, oh, maybe this whole thing's overblown. Maybe we just need to open it up, you know, and then, you know, it just, it seems like people kind of just fall into that bias uh, because there, there's all these different paths laid out before us, you know, it's pretty much just take whatever, pick whatever one makes you feel the best. It's kind of what, what, what this has come to. It's not so much necessarily revolved around what is exactly true, but what makes you feel good when you read it. But um, I want to, uh, you, you, CJ, you talked a little bit about on the masks. Um, that was one of the things I, I wanted to kind of refute with the pandemic that that was at the end of the show um let me see here uh oh yeah the, what i wrote that the claim they made in the show was that protecting yourself from viruses would actually weaken your immune system and it seems like you you kind of covered that quite a bit and i just want to say that 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 with with that show I completely disagree with that. You know, you need wearing a mask for a few hours a day is not going to drastically weaken your immune system. You know, that's just a joke. It's it's not some conspiracy theory to get you to wear masks so that way it's going to weaken your immune system and you're going to get super sick after. But uh, the the next claim was that uh, doctors are actually being incentivized to report deaths. Uh, and sicknesses that are uh, th th to report them as coronavirus, even though they're not coronavirus. And this is something I've heard from several different sources. And I, I do believe it, it does raise some concerns because there is act there, the government is actually giving these hospitals money when they report that they have coronavirus uh, deaths. And when they go on ventilators, they actually get more money. So that is a bit of a conflict of interest. And in my guess, it, it may result in a couple hundred extra deaths that were not actually coronavirus deaths uh, that were added to the toll, maybe because of just some greedy doctors out there. Okay, That's a possibility. But we're, there's actually several hundred people a day dying in, in New York alone that aren't being counted because they're dying at home. And this is something that I've seen from multiple different states, multiple different sources all across the globe. This is happening where they're not actually counting the people that are dying at home because uh, they could have died from anything, you know. And the really, the really convincing thing when it comes to this, this overcounting versus undercounting, because according to the conspiracy theorists, they wouldn't even assume that we have the seventy-five thousand 
deaths in the U.S. that we are currently counted at, uh, they would assume that that number is just trying to scare people into believing that it's bigger than it really is. But if you look at excess mortality graphs, it is absolutely shocking. Uh, just one that I was, uh, Dr. Martinson talked about on his show today, actually. He's talked about these excess mortality graphs a lot on his show because they're so important. Basically what it does, the graph, it just measures how many people is dying per day. And if you look at how many people die per day on a yearly basis and you compare year by year by year by year uh, through the decades, it's actually very, very consistent. There, you know, there's very few anomalies. And even when the flu season comes through, it barely picks up. It goes through these little tiny bumps. And in every single country that I've seen so far of these excess mortality graphs, there is huge spikes, which don't even account for uh, the, the, the huge majority of the deaths that are official deaths from COVID deaths. So uh, those two things combined, the fact that we're hearing of people not being counted from when they die at home, which if you think about it, this whole claim that doctors are being incentivized to count deaths in their hospital as COVID deaths because they get more money from the government, that wouldn't pertain to the deaths that are dying at home. So uh, in fact, you could say that the, a lot of the governors and and presidents and leaders are actually more incentivized to not count these deaths because it makes it look like they're handling this pandemic better. So I would suggest that there's actually an incentive in the opposite direction to incentivize people not to count these deaths. So the real quick, just looking at one of these uh, excess mortality graphs, this one is in the UK. And if you remember, the UK early on was talking about, oh, let's just let this run rampant through our population. Let's just quickly get to the herd immunity and get this over with. So they were very slow to act in their lockdowns. And the the graph I'm looking at here, it must be a couple days old because it says they had 24,000 confirmed COVID deaths at the time of this graph. Okay, But the excess deaths that they've seen in this period of time, which is deaths above the historical average, which like I said, this is a very consistent way to measure deaths. They've had 55,000 deaths above the historical average. So that's nearly double the deaths. And, and you know, you, obviously those aren't all COVID deaths. You could say maybe people are committing suicide. Maybe there's all sorts of things going on. But another interesting perspective is there's there should be a dip in deaths from the lockdowns because there's less people driving, there's less people going to bars and 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 things like that, you know. So you would think that there would be sort of a dip in deaths, but yet we're seeing a huge spike in deaths. And Chris Martinson showed this excess mortality graph uh, on the country of Spain, and there has never in the history of Spain been an increase in deaths that we've seen here. So I think that claim is just completely backwards. And that's that's kind of what this whole pandemic video was driving at, was that this thing is fake, that this virus is fake, it's a hoax, it's overblown, okay? The connections they made to Fauci and the sketchiness around the Wuhan lab, maybe it was manipulated by humans. Okay, that might be true. I'm, I'm not saying that that isn't true. I can totally get on board with some of those theories, but that doesn't mean that this virus is fake. It is for sure killing unprecedented amounts of people. Uh, was there anything that either of you guys wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, you know, I actually, uh, I think that the inconsistencies in the way that we gauge deaths not only in the US, but across the world is very troubling. And it really just begs like, what's the real purpose of something like NATO or the WHO or the UN if like in a time of crisis, we can't come together and say, okay, this is what a coronavirus death is because this is affecting all of us as a world. This is why this type of organization and structure exists. And it just falls apart when we need it. And now we have countries arguing, well, you have more deaths, I swear, because we definitely don't have more deaths, but you have to. You know, it's like, it seems like there's this weird finger pointing thing. And uh, you're absolutely right. Like, there's a profit motive for a hospital to have deaths, and there's a profit motive for a governor and a president to downplay the deaths. And you have this weird kind of 
you have a, a weird fight going on between those two things. And I actually personally believe that's a big part of the reason why the U.S. hasn't been testing aggressively per capita, because we don't want, I don't think we really want to know how bad it is. And if we really were testing in a sensible way per capita, we could see these numbers spike immediately, even with lockdown measures, just by testing more. But I also think it's the right thing to do. You know, we need to understand how bad it is in certain places to really move forward. But, uh, but, but these inconsistencies in the reporting and the testing and what a death is or isn't, it makes it hard for us to know what's going on. Yeah, and just real quick here, since you touched on the, the tests per capita um, that's something we hear Trump talk about a lot. We've done the most tests. And this is another one of those uh, data manipulation things that is really easy. That If you look at it from a certain slice, it looks a certain way. But if you're looking at it from a different slice, it looks a different way. So I actually made a post on our Facebook group the other day. I don't want to count all these right now. But I, when I made the post a couple of days ago, we were ranked number 42 in tests per capita and real quick so some of the countries we're behind we're behind canada we're behind australia singapore russia austria new zealand switzerland norway italy spain per capita we've done much less tests than those so uh, this whole defense that we have that uh you know we're, we only have so high numbers because we're doing so many tests it really doesn't hold up on a per capita basis well yeah and it's like the more tests that you do um if you end up with more and more uh you know positive outcomes i think that's what really starts to incite a sort of like riot factor or riot yeah riot factor and <laughs> just makes people uneasy and it makes them a lot harder to manipulate and keep home but then again you also don't want to lose the fear factor on that other end because you want to keep people to at least like, you know, stay, you know, sanitary and, you know, not overdo it, but then make sure not to underdo it as well. It's like kind of this back and forth, like people, you have to get people the right amount of, of information to keep them just uh, cautious enough. So that way, you know, people aren't freaking out per se, but they are preparing. So I think that has a lot to do with the amount of testing and, I'm sure with the amount of or how often we're doing counting of deaths, I mean, that's the thing too. You know, you don't know if these deaths are being put off being counted for, you know, two weeks or so. Are we counting them after they've been buried? Are we, you know, are we right when they die and we sign it off, they become a statistic? Or, are, you know, are these things being gathered and being released at, you know, a certain rate, therefore to, you know, basically manipulate the way the American people view this thing and, you know, therefore keeping everything just kind of balanced where it needs to be. Yeah, I agree. And the The stock market is a huge factor in this because right now, a little bit what we were talking about before the show was this bear market rally that we are currently in because uh, those who follow the stock market know that we had a really serious crash a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, I heard things thrown around. This is bigger crash than the Great Depression. I can't remember exactly what they were comparing it to, but definitely a very historical crash that we had. And uh, ever since then, we've been going up and we've been going up and going up. And, uh, you know, these numbers, you know, the, the, the real institutional investors, they are really locked onto these numbers. They want to know what is this virus doing? And you know, the stock market is so important because we have 401k people, you know, baby boomers down to people my age in their 20s uh, starting their 401ks, which go straight into the stock market. And I don't know if we could function as a society if that just crashed and just everyone's 401k just halved or less. Uh, so, you know, it's really important for the leaders of our country to keep the stock market up. So yes, there is probably quite a bit of number manipulation going on, uh, case count manipulation. And like something we, we talked about on previous shows, is we've never really ramped up our testing more than 200,000 per day. We've kind of slowly worked our way up to 200,000. And then we, we started, you know, that's when we started seeing like, oh, wow, we had a thousand cases in the USA. Wow, we had 3,000. Oh, we had 10,000. And now we're seeing over 20,000 every day. 
And but that only happened because we ramped our testing up. So really, we're testing less than 0.1% of our population every day. We really have no idea what this virus is doing. And, and it, it's just so politicized. Like everything in this country now. Yeah. So the, the next claim I wanted to touch on with the pandemic, uh, I think I think I've pretty much made my point here. Why this this whole conspiracy thing is just it's dangerous. Honestly, it's straight up dangerous. I can stand here on the mic right now and guarantee that somebody is going to die from that video, that that pandemic video. Somebody is going to die from that because it at the end of it, it suggested don't wear a mask. There, you know, you need to get out and expose yourself because it's better for your immune system. Start opening things up. There's no real problem. So I can I can personally guarantee that somebody is going to die from that video. So, uh, but just a, a, we can touch on these these last couple points a little bit here. Um, what they were talking about on hydroxychloroquine. I'm not sure how much you guys have looked into that. Um, so. There's a lot of misinformation and real information. It's just a total shit storm around hydroxychloroquine, okay? So first of all, Trump started talking about it like it was going to be a miracle drug. So first of all, when Trump talks about anything, that means it's automatically splitting the country into two because you're going to have his supporters that believe him and then you're going to have the people that hate him just hate him with a deep hatred, just undeniable hatred, uh, they're going to try and find fault in anything he says. So that means if Trump likes hydroxychloroquine, automatically half the country now hates hydroxychloroquine. So it, Dude, it's so true. He could say he he loves puppies and tomorrow half the country be like, fuck puppies. Exactly. I hate them. It's so, it's fucking hilarious from the outside, honestly. It's just hilarious. But, but, but so basically... That with this hydroxychloroquine, there's been several studies in the U.S. that have come out that just say it's garbage. And if you look at uh, Chris Martinson's episodes, he actually breaks down the studies and says they were just not done right here in the U.S. And there's actually a couple studies done in France and Spain that actually seem to show a good amount of promise with this hydroxychloroquine. But there's so many people that just hate it now. And now the new thing that Fauci talk, is talking about is the remdesivir, which is a new drug, very, very similar to hydroxychloroquine, I believe, and antiviral. And it costs way more, though. And it hasn't really shown that much promise. But yet, any little, any little trace of hope that it shows, the media just puts on blast and says that it's, it's the, the, the real thing that's going to make a difference in in the the fight against this virus and of course the stock market just loves that they want us they want to see that we have figured this virus thing out so they're putting out all the headlines which something i've talked about on previous shows is there is algorithms that do most of the trading now so those algorithms read those headlines and trade within seconds of that article being released so they see this article about how remdesivir is going to save everything and it keeps the stock market up and everybody wins except for the people that need to get the remdesivir treatment and have to pay all this money. And we don't even really know if it's that effective. So anyone listening to this, keep an open mind to any of these things. Just keep. There's a lot of misinformation about all these drugs. Hydroxychloroquine may actually be a fairly good thing against this if you catch it early on. And also one of the claims against hydroxychloroquine was that it would uh, create heart failure. And Doc Chris Martinson looked way back into the history of this drug. This is not something new. This is something we've studied for a very long time. And there's never been a problem with patients having heart failure from this drug. So it's just very questionable. So that's actually something I do agree with on the, the pandemic show is the sketchiness around hydroxychloroquine. I do think it could potentially be something useful uh, against this fight. Was, it, was there anything you guys had read about those specifically or about, or about any of the treatments? Uh, there's nothing that I read that you didn't brush up on, but I think there's like three things that are happening there. It's the, the media's desire to keep their ratings up because I mean, it's just a matter of fact that the ratings were really hurting, you know, even things like the Oscars and the Emmys people weren't watching anymore and they're having a fucking field day right now. These are the best ratings they've had in, had in years. So they're desperate to put things out to maintain those ratings. We are desperate for 
any kind of hopeful information, even though like in normal times, they wouldn't be recommending drugs these soon. You know, they'd want to do more, more trials to avoid lawsuits, but we're so desperate for information. They're, they're going to pump it out prematurely. And then it's like you said, there's like the stock market, like ready to put money behind kind of anything to at least paint the perception that like everything's fine. These, these markets are just like steady rolling. And uh, it's, 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 it's creating, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's never a good idea to rush into a drug that hasn't gone through the proper clinical trials. Because I'm not going to say that I'm like inherently anti-pharmaceutical outright, but I think that uh, you shouldn't be messing with that stuff unless you're informed and you know that you, you need it or it's the best course of action. I think it's, it's always kind of foolish to prematurely mess with pharmaceuticals. But that, like, that's just my opinion. No, I agree because it's not something you really want to, you know, you don't want to throw yourself into it. it it's kind of like, I mean, I, I, I definitely feel for those people out there right now that are like, you know, hey, if there's a, there's a vaccine to be tested, shoot me up with it. Like, let's, let's see if it'll cure me. My grandpa said those exact words. <laughs> I'm serious, dude. He's like, I'll, I'll be the first one in that trial, man. I just want to go back to normal life. I'm like, I mean, there's, yeah, there's nothing, you know, that says, uh, you know, the, the A solution is going to be the, you know, perfect solution or the B solution. And, you know, that's going to be part of the problem as well is that we're going to be, you know, at a point where there's going to be, you know, four, five, six, you know, 10, 20 different ways of treatment of and different drugs and vaccines and, you know, clinical trials and all these things are getting just, you know, pushed through and, you know, they're getting pushed through approval just for testing. And I mean, that's like one of those things that you kind of get, get stuck with you, what you don't know. Like, and I mean, you, nobody's going to want to just up and start taking something, I guess, other than KJ's grandpa. <laughs> but um, when you, uh, you know, when you, when you put it in a perspective that you're, you know, you're intentionally injecting your body with a foreign uh, substance that could possibly result in, you know, a mile long of conditions, um, you know, you want to make sure that that thing has, you know, been pretty severely tested. You know, I'm, I'm not talking a hundred people were tested and they've had positive results. Like, you usually want to see, you know, up in the tens of thousands of people that have been tested with using this vaccine or this. Yeah, and you, you need variables exactly. and you need you need consistency. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you need all the. Yeah, you want to see what happens yeah, to exactly, people in exactly. three years, four years, five years. You know, what happens if you shoot people up with the vaccine that, bam, cures you of the Rona, like right now, but then 10 years from now, you get fucking yeah. lung cancer. Like, there's, there's just so many things. You need placebos. You need all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Your dick just falls right off. <laughs> it's all factors that we like, you know, we don't take into accountability. And like, you know, when they're sitting here pushing these drugs and saying, you know, hey, let's, you know, let's push this, let's push that, let's see if this works, let's, you know, add some zinc and vitamin C and add this and add this, and you know, it's just like right now for the next probably like year and a half to you know three four years, it's probably going to be a just take your damn vitamins, take your vitamin C and be, you know, sanitary and, you know, practice precautions when it comes to going out and being in public places. But, um, you know, as a cure or as a, even a treatment, like I, I mean, you could, when it comes down to a treatment, then, you know, there, everything's kind of up in the air. There's, you know, so many different ways to go. And I think everybody just needs to get on board on the same you know, the same side of the road, so that way we're all headed in the right direction when it comes down to, okay, this one's promising, and, you know, not worry about who's going to make the most money at the end of the day or what's more expensive at the end of the day. I mean, frankly, if there's a, you know, some sort of uh, treatment that costs a million dollars a vial, but it would cure everybody in the United States or everybody globally, like, you know, generally speaking like has a global position there should be some sort of you know okay cool well let, let's just all develop this let's all get on and up together and you know let's just at, at least eradicate the world of this thing if not a uh, you know completely shut it down to a you know a flu-like sense you know not something that oh shit you have covid stay home for two weeks you know like okay you've got 
Corona, like, let's treat it with this, or let's, you know, it's it's going to be real interesting to see where we're at, where we're at, like, five years from now. Yeah, and that, that actually kind of leads into the point I want to close with. I, I always think we're able to do, like, a half-hour show, but then I look at the clock and we're over an hour. So, you know what? I, that's great, though, in my opinion. But the, the thought I wanted to end with, uh, so when it comes to this pandemic show, uh, they, the kind of the, the main driving theme behind the show was that basically this, this virus was introduced so that somebody could come up with a vaccine and make a bunch of money off of it. And in my opinion, I think that's just thinking way too small. Okay, first of all, we don't know if this was released on purpose or on accident. The evidence so far seems to suggest that it probably did come from that lab. It could very well have been just an accident. No no real planning behind it. It's really hard to contain these things, but let's say it was released on purpose for some reason. It, it, I don't think it would just be, first of all, nobody really has a vaccine for any coronavirus in the world. If we do come up with a vaccine for this coronavirus, it'll be the first coronavirus vaccine in existence. So there is that. This was definitely not the most ideal disease to come up with a vaccine for. Um, but if this was released on purpose, so something that me and KJ and CJ were talking about before the show is just how incredibly ridiculous the financial markets have become. And I think that maybe this, this because there was a huge crash coming. It was just a matter of time. It could have even gone on for another five or 10 years. Who knows? But, you know, the repo market's pretty much broke recently. We've been doing quantitative e easing just to infinity, just unlimited bond buying, which is basically just throwing more money into the economy. All these different backdoor bailouts that we've been we've been doing into the economy. And maybe somebody looked at it and was just like, this is just not sustainable. We need an exit route. And maybe this virus is that exit route. So if you want to get on board with conspiracies, it's not about the vaccines. Okay. You need to think bigger than that. This is a global phenomenon. This is not about some company making a few billion dollars. Okay. We're not dealing in billions anymore. A trillion dollars is nothing now. Okay. A trillion dollars, by the way, just for a little perspective, if you take a thousand dollar bills, okay, so one bill is one thousand dollars, and you stack those bills four inches high, that's a million, okay? To get to a trillion, you have to stack those thousand dollar bills 67 miles high. So just an absolute incomprehensible amount of money. We're talking about trillions here. And they're printing trillions almost every fucking day now. So this is not some just minor little thing to make some company a little bit of money. If it's something, I believe it is a complete restructuring of the global debt. And it's, it's something that basically takes all the blame off of all of the politicians. Every politician in the world that has all been fucking this up for decades. Obama fucked it up. Bush fucked it up. Clinton fucked it up. Okay, They all fucked it up. Trump has fucked it up as well. None of them are innocent. And all the people that work behind the scenes that we don't even know about, they all fucked it up too. So if anything, this is was meant to be released as some sort of global reset. What do you guys think about that idea before we go ahead and sign off? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think like this financial collapse is something that's been imminent when you look at the amount of you know, student loan debt's a, a great example. Like you use a trillion dollars example. We've got almost tr two trillion in that. That's debt that can't be wiped away, can't be bankrupted out of, you know, if I die on subsidized loans, get passed off to my family. Um, the amount of homelessness we had, just the simple fact, like so many Americans are we're living paycheck to paycheck in the greatest economy we've ever had that after just a few weeks of being shut down, they had to give everybody $1,200. That's not a good economy in my mind. If the average person isn't reaping the benefits, how's that a good economy? Oh, like, you know, some rich asshole bought a second island. The economy's great. Fuck yeah. Like, no, dude, I'm struggling here still. And this is this has been a long time coming. I mean, just just like it got it started 
a long time ago. It's a it's, you know the, the the problem of kings and peasants. But like after two thousand eight, the wealth distribution in our country shifted exponentially, and it's been getting worse every year. The amount of billionaires has doubled since then. And you know, you mentioned how much a trillion dollars is. A billion is nothing to laugh at either. I mean, a billion is you could be making five thousand dollars a day. You'd have to work for hundreds of years to make a billion dollars at five thousand dollars a day, spending nothing. That's insane. No human should have that much health in their personal account when this many people are struggling to get by. And I'm not just talking about, you know, whatever your opinion is, like people who are sitting there asking for handouts. I'm saying when working class people who dedicate their lives to working their asses off are always living three months away from homelessness, that's a fucking problem. That's a real fucking problem. These financial markets are not stable. I mean, the money's just not spread, spread across and like, uh, I word mumbled there, but uh, I think like what Elon Musk did this week is a really good example. You know, like this is the kind of thing you're going to see. He sends out a tweet and he says, Tesla stock price is too high, IMO. And it drops 10% immediately. He, I mean, I, I actually personally like him more than most billionaires, which I don't know how much that's saying, but that, I mean, he, he should, he should go to prison for insider trading. Are you kidding me? I mean, you can't tell me that he didn't have personal conversations saying, hey, look out for a tweet. There's, there, there's no way. There's no, there's no way. The guy's a master at manipulating his stock price. I mean, Tesla wasn't profitable for like, what was it, like eight, 10 years? They just turned their first profit a few quarters ago, but his stock price has always been through the roof. It's never made sense. So I, I, I completely agree with you that like this has all been really shaky territory. And... um. You know, if there was type like some type of incentive, like I, I definitely agree that it's much more plausible to have it be involved with like a restructure of like the economics in a way that they can maintain their like their distribution of power within this new system that they have to fabricate. Like that's way more that's way more plausible than just like, oh, one company's gonna make a vaccine, the whole world's in on it. Like that's come on, that's that's a little short sighted. And uh, one thing that I've been like thinking a lot about, so I'm just gonna kind of interject it. Um, this isn't necessarily like a conspiracy theory I have. This is something that I think a lot about because regardless of whether or not this is a, a plan or a scam or it's real or not, Edward Snowden exposed that they are collecting data from us. They are using surveillance methods and they're collecting bulk meta metadata profiles based on all of the data that we have. GPS signals in our phone, what we Google, all of that stuff. You know, just aggregate data of who we are and they have these really complex profiles. And my point about that is that whether or not this is orchestrated, they are getting real-time information about how a control works. You know, if they decide that we want to, you know, can we control society? If, the, if something was made up, they're seeing how well people respond to that. And that concerns me a little bit. And that, you know, they're getting that information no matter what, real or not. They know how many people are obeying it to what capacity. They're seeing how many people are social distancing and how long they're staying home. And if they're going to non-essential places, like they can see all that. Even if it's not their intention or their plan, they still get that data. And I don't know. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a big advocate that this like, that this overreach into our privacy is very dangerous into like what could very potentially become a totalitarian government. You know, someone like Trump, like everyone was like, he's a fascist, he's a fascist. It's like, no, he, he just idolizes fascists. You know, he just masturbates the fascists. But what he does is he opens the door to a real fascist. He's empowered dangerous people in this country. He's empowered misinformation to a dangerous scale. And we have these mechanisms of a massive police state in place. And I just really fear what happens if that gets into the wrong hands. And most people would say Trump's the wrong hands. And I think you're being naive if you think this is the worst it could be. And I guess that's like my, my big concern with all of this is like what, what this could lead to, you know, what all of this polarization and hatred and uh, just what it could lead to is very concerning in a time when we really should be trying to come together. We should be trying to represent like what American values are supposed to be on paper. Yeah, well, I mean, we were really in a point, you know, headed downhill to where, um, you know, especially with just the way that, uh, not even our country, but just globally, um, it was handled. It's like, you know, one of those things that a global restructuring was like almost imminent. And now that we're at this point, like, I mean, I get what you're saying about the overreach of privacy and stuff like that, but 
I almost believe that, like, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, some sort of overstepping is necessary to track and to see, you know, what kind of possibilities there are out there. Like, okay, if we, you know, we put these strict regulations in, you know, are people going to follow them? And then, you know, are we going to have a bad reaction? Are people going to be fighting? <laughs> are people going to be, uh, you know, like, they've already had reports of people that, uh, you know, would go in grocery stores and people told them they couldn't wear masks and, or, or like they said they didn't want to wear a mask and people told them to leave and then that resulted in a big blow up. And it's kind of like, you know, you see these things over and over again and then realize like, okay, so like there has to be some sort of restructure because, you know, life will absolutely not go back, back to the same as it was before this at all. Yeah, and I mean, and that's the same with our, you know, our global economy. It's not going to be nowhere near where it was at the beginning of this. And who, who knows if it'll be back? Who knows if it'll jump up higher? All I know is there's going to be a hell of a long, uh, you know, period of time where things are just going to kind of be at a rest. I mean, like J Jerry said, like how, you know, we're kind of pretty close to a, you know, a second crash. And, if you know if that happens today tomorrow you know two months from now a month from now regardless you know it's still gonna it's gonna have such a global impact that we're gonna have to restructure <laughs> and i mean if that you know like i said when it comes down to it if you have to put out certain regulations and say okay people can only do this people have to do that i mean you have to kind of test the waters i guess in a sense on uh, I don't even want to say like a totalitarian government, of, of, but with that sort of control, like you do have to have some sort of control and regulation on the American people. And I mean, that's the same sense globally, just to ensure that whatever practices get put into place are actually, you know, beneficial and successful. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting with uh, what you were t talking about with the surveillance Thing, you know it's it's absolutely mind-blowing what they are doing first of all with extracting the information and then with the algorithms and the new ai technology that they are able to use to just put all of us into the all these different boxes and i mean things that we can't even comprehend just what is going on behind the scenes with this mass data collection and you know, maybe uh, I, if I re read what you're saying, right, CJ, maybe there is somewhat of a, a possible uh, advancement of technology to just studying that, that massive amounts of data. And so I just do want to bring in the, the, the fourth turning here a little bit. I mean, it, based on what you said, KJ, you know, it seemed, things seem like they could really get to a dark point. And this is this is what society has felt many, many, many times in our past. And it, it, because we see things in a linear direction, like things have been getting worse and worse and worse. So we, we kind of project out in the future that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. But there's always a breaking point where people just are not willing to stand up for that shit anymore. So, you know, kind of tying this all together, maybe we're kind of advancing our technology into this AI sort of the incomprehensible level of computation that is really going to set the tone for the next age. But we do need to go through that breaking point still, that fourth turning that resets back into the first turning, which is basically where we learn all our hard lessons and we learn, oh my God, we can't all just be polarized. We can't be fighting each other. We can't be against each other. We need to unite and and maybe hopefully the remnants of this this new technology uh kind of hangs on and and our, a new leader can come in so a leader that we all can really get behind that can really uh set the tone for the next first turning which which uh so all of us i believe we're all around the same age i don't know your age kj but we're, we're in the the millennial group which is actually defined as the hero generation which th there's been ma many hero generations in the past and the reason we're called the hero generation is because we are at our prime age going into the crisis so there's the elder generation which is kind of providing their wisdom into the crisis and then there's the middle aged which is kind of providing the leadership 
going into the crisis, but the, the hero generation, which is anyone from like 20 to 30, you know, around there is the, the kind of the able-bodied, the ready to go, ready to learn, ready to grow, ready to just take the reins on this crisis. And we, we are going to be kind of the middle-aged generation uh, post-crisis, which uh, according to history, this, this crisis will probably be a five, 10 year period before things really get to a more stable point where we've learned our lessons. We've been beaten down by the pain of, of uh, and, and you know what, it's, it's really, there's so many different tangents this could go off because we're at a point, like I said, in past shows that we have nuclear technology, uh, we could literally destroy the whole planet in this crisis. That's a possibility. This could, you know, it, we could destroy everything, but hopefully there's something that remains through this crisis. Hopefully it's very minimal, honestly. Hopefully it's just a financial thing we got to deal with, but uh, you know, hopefully we can all get through this and uh, create a better society after this. So I really appreciate talking with both of you. I've got to admit, KJ, this is the first time I've met you. I'm really impressed with your, your knowledge on finance and geopolitics and everything. I would absolutely love to have you on. So I just want to thank you for being on the show tonight. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, TJ, and I, I had a good time, and I just wanted to throw one thing out there in relation to the stock market crash you guys have been talking about, because I think it might be cool to end on a relevant note instead of just like me fucking talk really about surveillance, which I don't think is objectively bad. I just worry about <laughs> what it could be, you know, just, just just to clarify. I'm not like, oh, no, I, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, the thing about this oh, financial yeah. crash, and I think it has a lot to do with why we're pushing these mar the, uh, the economy reopen so soon is um, we had that first dip and then we just pumped trillions into the stock market. And that's why it went back up. But it's just a factual matter that factories are shut down, people aren't working, people aren't spending. It's just That's just what it is. And I think they're trying to get people out in the workforce spending and making because if it continues at this rate and the next quarter earnings come out and we have had a shutdown economy for that whole quarter, you're going to have that mega collapse that you guys are talking about. And I know the politicians don't want that. I mean, they've they've got money in the markets too. But I think that's something to watch out for. You know, like like the next quarter earnings in relationship to how we force the economy open and what industries are involved in being open and staying shut down. Because there's there's definitely going to be opportunities to make money in all this in the stock market. You know, people always profit when the market falls. That money doesn't just vanish. It goes into pockets. Yeah, you buy when there's blood in the streets, you know, buy low, sell high. That's kind of the, the most basic understanding. And, and there's a lot of investors that are waiting for this crap. I mean, I'm one of them. I got to admit, I haven't really been into investing, but with as much as I've been learning lately, I'm almost waiting for this next crash to where potentially I could get my hands on some dirt cheap companies, uh, you know, so that's something to think about. So yeah, I want to uh, I'm really glad we had this show tonight. I want to remind all of our listeners uh, to go ahead and check us out on Facebook. Also, if you like the show, give us a thumbs up, uh, follow our channel, subscribe, whatever. Uh, click the little bell so you get the notifications when we come out with a new show. We'd really appreciate that. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we can go ahead and, and end with that. Uh, go ahead and tune in next week. We'll, we'll actually do another show on Friday. So we'll release this one. Uh, tomorrow and then we'll have another one for you this weekend so go ahead and stay tuned for more good content from us thanks again guys take it easy yeah thanks <laughs>